What's up guys, George Camel here, co-host of The Ramsey Show. And we are back with another episode of the best of The Ramsey Show. Now these are some of the most shocking calls we've taken on the show. From a woman who needs help getting away from her abusive boyfriend, to a caller whose boss died and left her a lot of money. Plus, you'll hear from a caller who had a bone to pick with Dave and had some choice words to describe him. Enjoy. Hi Danielle, how are you? Hi Mr. Ramsey, thank you very much for taking my call. Sure, what's up? Um, I'm in a position where I'm thinking about selling my house. My son's father and I live together and it's not the best situation. Um, your blinds.com advice actually was pretty spot on as far as our situation goes. Um, I've connected with one of your ELPs and I'm just really torn because I love my home and I love my neighborhood, but I just want to be able to pay my debt off and provide better for my son. Okay, uh, so you own the home with your boyfriend, or? No, sir, it's just me. You own it? Yes. Okay. Um, when is he leaving? Uh, that's a great question. Well, I'll give you the answer. Tonight. <laughs> I can hear it. No, no, I can hear it in your voice. You sound really afraid to me. Yeah, well, I'm trying to talk to you outside, and he's actually standing next to me because he can't go inside. What? Sir, yeah. um, I have about $16,000 worth, worth of debt. Um, it includes a car, a credit card, some medical debt from the birth of our son mm -hmm. that I get no help with. Yeah. Um, my home... Your ELP said that I could potentially walk away with about 88000 Yeah. So I could reasonably pay all that off. I could set my son up and myself up in a nice townhome or a reasonable townhome in a nice area. Good schools. Mm. You know, I've thought all this well, out. What is your income? Uh, I just got a promotion at my job. I've been there about 10 years. Um, I don't quite know what it works out to be, but it's $21 an hour. I believe it's like 44 Okay. How, how old are you? I'll be 32 this month, sir. How old's your baby? Eight months. Hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know if you need to sell your house or not. You may. That's possible. But that's not your problem today, is it? No, sir. Yeah. Okay. Do you have family in the area? Uh, huh? I do. Um, my mom passed away about two years ago, unfortunately. So who, um, I still have my dad and brothers. And, oh, you have dad um, and you have a father and brothers in the area. Yes, sir, and my grandma and my aunt who would have room for me and Charlie, my son. Okay. Um, you need to get in the car and go to your dad's house when you hang up the phone. I can't do that, sir. I've tried that already. Why can't you do that? <sighs> do I need to call the police for you? <laughs> No, sir. We've already gone through that. Uh, well, I'm about to go through it again. You I'm have to, you, you Daniel, understand? where where are you, Danielle? Are you outside your house right now? Yes, I am. You are. Okay. Do you have car keys? Where's Char Where's your Where's your son? In uh, his father's house. Okay. In front of my car. All right. You need to uh, when you hang up. You need to call the police. And you need to call your father. And you need to get you and your son away from this guy. Do you hear me? Do you understand? This is not going to work otherwise, honey. This is not a house problem and it's not a debt problem. You and your son are in danger. Do you understand me? Hello? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Where'd you go? Sir, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Where are you? Okay. okay. I'm sorry. I'm, so, I'm did, here. Did you hear what I said, or were you distracted? Yes, I did, sir. No, I heard you. Okay. So are you going to sit there in the middle of the sewage, or are you going to fix it? I want to fix it. That's why I want to sell my home, and I just want to no, be done No, with no, everything. no, honey, honey. We don't need to call a realtor. We need to get the boyfriend out of the house, and that's going to involve the police and or your father and your brothers. He needs to leave. It's your house. 
and you're afraid. You understand that this is wrong, right? Yes, sir. Okay. This is this is you're you're not the crazy one. I'm talking to the sane one. You know, a lot of times it feels like that. Yeah, I know. All right, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put you on hold, and Kelly is going to make sure that law enforcement gets over there. Okay. No, sir. No, sir. Please. No, baby doll. I'm not going to be. No, I'm. I'm not. I listen. Can't. I love you and that baby. And we're not, do what? Just need to know if I should tell my house or not. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I it's should okay. Have it's okay, honey. You're you're in I a whole. Mr. Ramsey, I'm sorry. I trust you. <laughs> listen, listen. Easy. Breathe. You're in a horrible situation, and you have to make the moves to get away from it. Okay. And part of mm-hmm. part of the type of situation that you are in is, is that his, part of his psychological job is he has convinced you that you're not able to operate without him. And I'm convinced the only way you're ever going to be able to operate is without him. Mm-hmm. You understand me? Yes, sir. Okay. You Listen, you are worth being okay. It's worth being okay for your kid. It's worth being okay. It's your freaking house. He's trespassing. We're going to remove the trespasser. It has to happen. Okay? You have to get away from this guy. Anyone who calls a national radio show and is in this kind of distress tells me that there's serious stuff going on inside your walls. You understand? (laughs) And then once Mm -hmm. he's clear... We're going to put you with one of our counselors free. I'm not going to charge you a dime, and we're going to walk with you, and then we can start making decisions about your finances. But you don't okay. have a financial problem. You need a boyfriend ectomy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I've been eating that. And it's happening today, darling. It's happening today. Yes, sir. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Today. And Danielle, if you feel like you need you and your son need to be somewhere safe, then I would get out of the house as well. I, I, removing him may not. Well, no, you, you know, you, but I mean, a, like, after he's gone, you can make this determination yeah, you, with you the, may need to go with somewhere. local law enforcement. But yeah. you know, get a restraining order. You can do whatever you need to do at that point. But you and the baby need to get out of there until he's gone, and then you need to get someone to remove him. And it's that simple. So. Um, th- that's what you have to do. And then you can begin to have a conversation uh, in, in some form of sanity because the situation you are in right now is insane. It's an insane situation. You're not insane. But the situation's crazy, girl. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey, we love you. You hold on a second. Kelly's going to pick up, okay? And we're going to make sure you get taken care of. You weren't scheduled to be involved in the show yesterday, but you got involved behind the scenes a little bit. Yeah. For those of you that were not around yesterday for whatever reason, uh, I don't usually tell you what yesterday is but all that, but this is the time we're going to stop and do that. Um, we had a young lady call in with Rachel and I on the air that um, became apparent during the call that she was uh, a victim of domestic violence. I don't even like saying that that way because it sounds so antiseptic. She was a victim of her boyfriend beating the crap out of her, yeah. is a better way of saying the truth. And uh, we determined that. And uh, then uh, while we were on the call, we determined he was in the room that he had walked in yeah. and was not happy. And so um, uh, it went from a uh, financial question to a uh, question of her safety and her child's safety and so forth on the air Mm -hmm. live that's pretty wicked weird Mm -hmm. and wild but um walked her through that a little bit and um john just happened to walk (laughs) by the studio (laughs) and stepped in and um i put her on hold and he does a lot has done a lot of uh trauma and uh crisis uh intervention type counseling over the years and so um trained in that but also experienced in that so we got on, you got on the phone with her and um we were able to get the uh, uh the police over there very quickly and uh the young man is sitting where he should be now in a cage um which is where people like that belong um 
and so uh, I think they call that a jail, but I called it a cage. Um, very similar. E- either one is very either one's fine with me, but they're both <laughs> similar situation here. This right. is where this little guy needs to be, and uh, so that was pretty wild discussion you were having in there off air. Yeah, I I noticed at one point I didn't know who would who was in there. You know, you kind of zone out and lock, try to lock. In 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 face to face, you lock eyes, but in those situations, you lock hearts with somebody. And then I noticed you'd come in there after a while. But, yeah, it, it was intense, mainly because it was live. It was happening live, and she was not – it wasn't philosophically unsafe. She was unsafe now, and somebody else had her kid. And then you've got a mom who needs to protect herself, but I'm not going to leave my baby unprotected. And now you've got a messy situation. And um, whenever I show up to something like that, I'm always looking at escalation trends. Is this thing slowing down? Are people separating and they just yelling at each other? Or is it moving up? And this one moved up real rapidly. And um, luckily, that police department there was super responsive and they showed up and I'm um, grateful to them. And at the end of the day, man, we're talking to a really brave, brave young woman, brave new mom. And um, she's got a hard row ahead of her. But uh, yeah, things got pretty dicey there for a minute. Yeah, and, and that's not that's not us Hollywoodizing this thing. It, no, it, it got just, pretty, pretty dicey. It was, it was it was very real. Yeah, and uh, he's a violent dude, and uh, so the uh, yeah, of course. So, so the end of the story is she's safe. Her, her family's around her, and of course we're gonna uh, we plugged her in with financial counseling. She does have some crisis financial situation Absolutely, as well. Yeah. And got so, some resources there, some but domestic that violence really resources. was not even on the table for discussion yesterday. Right. So, but our our team is rallying around her. We're plugging her in with counselors, and not of course no charge, and sure. we're just going to walk with her and make sure she gets gets her life uh, changed in a different direction because it sure was going down the toilet pretty fast. There. And, we, and we did. We we connected her to some um, domestic violence resources there in Tampa too, so that she can have a local community that can be hands on there. Yeah, good. and yeah. So so she's safe. And good for those of you that were listening. A lot of you have been, you know, emailing us and worried and so forth. And uh, so we thought we would give you guys a bit of an update. And, you know, it's odd. You and I were talking, I think it was last week on the air, about this correlation between um, extreme control over money issues and yeah. domestic violence. Yeah. That yeah. there's a correlation between that because there's this where, where, a, where a husband or a boyfriend it will not let you pick the cereal at the grocery store. You can't go grocery shopping by yourself. You can't by detergent you can't do anything without his approval on every little nuanced thing where there's that level of weird toxic control over a lady a woman uh with the money it's it's a high statistical indicator that he's probably hitting her Mm. it's it's just about power right and i'll take that power wherever i can get it yeah it's about power and control and boy he you know that was going on yesterday and you could smell it in the air so i put her on the air air it was um it didn't take a genius to figure out what was to you know to figure out what i was dealing with what we're going into there but you know i think the the thing that um you can't get away from uh, on the positive side uh, or the negative side of toxic toxic behaviors is that um or behaviors is that personal finance is 80% behavior. It's only 20% head knowledge. So the chances of you being in a relationship that are that dysfunctional and being wealthy, yeah, uh, becoming wealthy mm-hmm. in a dysfunctional setting is just almost impossible. Right. Uh, because it, it, these things don't live in one nice little compartment over here. Right. Uh, and then not bleed over, or, or not, not bad, bad metaphor, but don't, don't reach over into the other areas of your life. Absolutely. So, I mean, you can't be... A punching bag in one area of your life and then suddenly be prosperous and healthy and uh, winning at your career and winning at your wealth building and that kind of thing. They just don't, it's not, we can't compartmentalize that tight. Right. And w- one of the challenges with relational abuse of any kind is you accept that as a given. You accept that as, well, some days are good days. Occasionally, he'll come in crying saying he's sorry and it's going to be okay. And so you start trying to solve that inner chaos at the margins. You tra- start trying to think of, well, maybe I can get a better interest rate or maybe I should trade my car in or it's probably my job. And, you're, and you distance yourself from this core nuclear reactor issue that is, hey, you're not safe. Your baby's not safe. And this thing just escalates this way, right? So um, 
to anyone well, listening. Well, the decisions you make on the money on the fringe is to avoid the nuclear That's reactor right. at the center right. are never good decisions. They're not. Because They're you're making them out of chaos, right? Yeah. Well, and you're making them uh, to uh, in order to mask. That's right. And in order, instead of dealing with, with the right. core issues. And so, you know, Larry Burkett used to say, debt is not the problem, it's the symptom. There you go. And so it's the symptom of a behavior. Margie's with us in Seattle. Hi, Margie. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Good. How can I help? Um, we're on baby step two, and um, my husband got served with a summons for a bad debt. Um, and so after talking to some debt relief attorneys, uh, like four of them, they suggested bankruptcy. Okay. And we're about thirty three, thirty four thousand dollars in debt and credit cards, and we have like a eleven thousand dollar loan on our car, and about a hundred thousand dollars worth of student loans combined. Okay. And and what's your household income? Fees, um, about twenty eight thousand mm-hmm. a year. Yeah. Okay. Who's not working? Me. Why? Um, my daughter is at home um, with COVID and everything and my anxiety. Your daughter is how old? Seven. Mm-hmm. And are you being treated for your anxiety? Yes. Okay. In what way? Um, therapy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let me give you a couple of facts that we can walk through, and then let's try to figure out how to help you, okay? Okay. Fact number one, student loans are not bankruptable. Okay? Yes, I know So that. after bankruptcy, you will still have $100,000 in student loan debt. Yeah. Fact number two... Your household income is $28,000. Y'all are starving to death. And bankruptcy will not fix your income problems. Okay? Okay. So after bankruptcy, we get rid of credit card debt. And by the way, you don't have a car anymore, or you still have a car payment. One of the two. Mm Mm-hmm. If you don't give up the car, you've still got the $11,000 in car. So really, when it gets down to it, if you're going to keep the car and reaffirm it, it's called in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, then you would have $33,000 in credit card debt is all you're bankrupting. Yes. And who served you? Um, Which credit um, card? Uh, um, mid- um, the credit card was Credit One Bank. Okay. And how much do you owe them? A thousand and six dollars. Okay. All right. Um, all right. The third fact is that debt relief attorneys are generally not debt relief attorneys. Generally, what they are is bankruptcy attorneys. And if you ask a bankruptcy attorney if you're bankrupt, that's like asking a dog if it's hungry. Yeah. So the advice you were getting from a quote unquote professional was self serving advice on their part. So these are the things that are disturbing me in in you know, so we're getting advice from people that are, you know, want you to file bankruptcy because it's what they do. You know, they're a hammer so everything's a nail. Um if you're gonna keep the car, we're not filing bankruptcy on very much. And really one thousand dollars is all that's triggering this and you have a household income of 28000 which is less than half the annual income of the typical household in America. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not shaming you. I'm just saying you guys have an income issue. I've been there myself. One year in my life, I made $6,000, okay? So I know how it feels. It ain't no fun. What's your husband do for a living? Um, he works at a, a car dealership. Doing what? He's a porter. Um, driving cars. Driving cars. 40 hours yeah. a week? Um, well, on average right now, 33. Yeah. And how old are you guys? 
in our 40s. Okay. All right. And so for me to help you have a good life a decade from now, I want to be able to paint a picture that gets rid of not only the immediate stress of this lawsuit, but also gets rid of $100,000 worth of student loan debt and allows you all to have the freedom. Can you imagine, can you even for a second wrap your brain around what it would feel like in your home if you guys made $60,000 a year and had no debt? I can. That's I where, envision it. Yeah, that's where I want you to go. And that's where my mind takes me on answering your question when you when I start gathering the pieces of information up. But there's a lot of things that are going to have to happen for us to live that dream together, okay? Mm-hmm. And I, I am not a mental health professional, and I do know that anxiety is real, and I am not uh, qualified to tell you when and if you can go back to work or what you could do. But I am qualified to tell you that your family needs income. And I'm qualified to tell you that 33 hours a week is not enough to work when your family's just broke. Your husband needs to get six more jobs. Especially since the one he has kind of sucks. Is that me and mean? No. But, I mean, it's a step up from where he was before. So. That's good. He's, then he needs yeah. to take, let's take two more steps up. Because he's in his 40s, and when he's in his 50s, I don't want him making $28,000 a year driving cars. Do you? No. Okay. Then we have to we have to intentionally take some steps up from here, and part of that's cleaning off this debt. Who's got these degrees with a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt? None of us. What did you study? Um, I did accounting, um, and I transferred school, so my credits didn't transfer, so I had to start all over, and so that's kind of made it difficult yeah. at one point and what was the last job went, that you had um a, a administrative assistant okay have you ever done accounting in the vo- as a vocation yes okay what did, what did you do um as, as an administrative assistant i did um partial done, accounting you helped them keep the books yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Because you do know how to do it. You just didn't finish with the degree. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. So there's a possibility you start doing accounting for some small businesses in the area as you're uh, working for yourself and doing that from home where you can keep your anxiety low. Maybe. Yeah. I've been looking for work from home. Okay. Um, careers, Is it the going out thing coming- that gives you anxiety? What gives you anxiety? Um, well, a ton of things, but, Mm -hmm. um, as for me getting a job, it's more of the, like, I'm afraid of letting them down, Mm -hmm. uh, like not being able to show up. Okay. I understand. Oh, I see. So if you had a, uh, an anxiety attack in the morning and weren't able to go to work, then you'd feel bad about letting them down and probably get fired eventually for doing that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Has that happened before? Um, well, it's happened where I haven't been able to um, go out. No, no, but it did lo- you lost your job as a result? No, okay. no. My anxiety came after. I see. After I stopped working. Oh, after you stopped working. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. I don't know anything. I mean, Dr. John Deloney's not here to help me with this, so I'm kind of trying to channel my inner Dr. D here. But the, um, uh, because I, I know that what you're facing is real. I do know that, and I'm not questioning that, but I'm trying to figure out a way to get you guys some income coming in. Up next is going to be Chris in Los Angeles. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave. How are you doing? Great, man. What's up? Um, there's a couple things. One, you, uh, you've done some great work, and in some ways, I love you. In other ways, you're stupid and arrogant. Okay. How can I help you? All right. By the way, that's a great way well, to start any conversation right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my first question would be, are you smarter than Warren Buffett? H- how old are you? 
because you push. I'm 35. Okay, cool. So, so what? what I'm sorry. I'm, I, let's stop just a second. What's the point of your call? How can I? How can I help you? The the point of my call is you push people into actively managed funds when over time, if you pushed people into an index fund, they would have about 50 percent more money when they retire. Okay. Um, not sure where you went to school for your math class, but you failed. Um, uh, the um, actually compounding costs. No, I I understand. Add up Listen, dramatically. I've been te- I got socks older than you. I've been teaching this a while. Okay, so uh, th- this is how this works. Now, here's the thing. You're basically become doing what Bogle said, and Bogle invented a wonderful thing with the index fund. And the S and P 500 funds are wonderful. The index funds are wonderful. Uh, they are not a cure-all, and there is no possible scenario, unless you're an absolute idiot in picking your actively managed funds, that you would have 50% more in an index fund. Now, the actual facts are more than 50% of the funds underperform the indexes. That is a true fact, to your point. That's a different fact. It, it's, the, yeah. the fact is 2%, 2%. Above, if you have a 7% return versus a 9% return, which you have the compounding costs bringing your return down by 2%, mm-hmm. over 50 years, mm-hmm. you'll have half the money. Do the math on that, well, Google that, it. That, that would be true, too, but none of those numbers you're using are accurate in terms of what the S&P has produced or what actively managed funds have produced. The actively managed funds that I personally have picked have outperformed the indexes by more than 2% as a portfolio because it's fairly easy to study mutual funds and pick them that outperform. But if you're not going to study them and you're not going to have a good advisor in your corner, then using the index funds is a great idea. Here's what we actually found in the real world versus, um, versus someone's hypothetical vacuum discussion of theory. Okay, As we studied the largest study of millionaires, 90% of them a largest study of millionaires ever done, over 10,000 of them, 90% of them became wealthy without becoming, without inheritance. The inheritance did not cause their wealth. And almost, Dave, all, and almost all of them did it with their 401k with actively managed funds. Now, some of the funds actually underperformed the S&P. And some of them overperformed the S&P. And some of them used an S&P because a, a good 500 fund was in their um, was in their portfolio as well. Now, let's go back to Warren Buffett for just a second. Are you aware that Warren Buffett does not have all of his investments in index funds? Of course. Okay, he has good. it in, so, in a holding then, what, company. I'm not sure. Other than the fact that he has stated that the average guy, because he's a Bogolite, the average guy should buy index funds instead of actively managed funds. Other than that, he doesn't actually do what he says he's going to do with that. He actually has an actively managed portfolio called Berkshire Hathaway. Are you aware of that? Yes, I am. And he's doing it with with the money he's leaving to his wife when he dies. Well, that's fine. I mean, where where the money's going is not not relevant to the mathematical discussion. The mathematical discussion, Chris, is simply this. Warren Buffett made comments frequently about the average guy should buy index funds. And I really don't have a problem with that. You can get rich with index funds. Not 50% richer. That's complete BS. But, you know, that is it, true. But, if you, but you can get rich with index funds. I don't have any problem with that at all. If that makes me arrogant, fine. But I think we're confused as to who's arrogant on this call, brother. I think that's the issue. I've got a book suggestion for Chris. It's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a classic. You should read it. No, I mean, it's good luck with it. I hope it works out for you, but um, here, here's the thing. I've been doing what I've been doing for 30 years, Chris, and it's made me a multi, 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 multi millionaire. And I invest in actively managed growth stock mutual funds that outperform the indexes across the four types we teach. I actually invest in what I tell people to do. I don't tell people to do something while I'm investing in something else. Alan is with us. Alan is in New Jersey, Newark, to be precise. Hi, Alan. How are you? How you doing, Ramsey? Um, just trying to put this all together, and I hope to see how we can best unpack this. Now, I have about, me and my wife have about like 900000 in debt, but it's not all crazy debt. It's investment debt. So just to uh, give you a runabout, um, just from what we make, 
Uh, my wife, she works at uh, the port. She's a longshoreman, and she makes about 160. I work in the IT field and uh, the data field, and I make about 115. So that's put that there. I have a nice little nest egg of about 60 grand that's put aside, and I'm 33. She's 32. We're married with four kids that's under 10. <laughs> so Ooh. it's 10 and under. Yeah, so that's one thing. Um, about the, the debt portion, I have about 166000 in my primary home. I bought a house that I renovated, and, you know, I just renovated it as a two-family home. And that's probably, ARV is probably worth about 400 right now, and I don't have no debt on that. But, however, I had to take it out about 100000 to put into the property to, to renovate it. All right, so so you do have debt on it or you don't? I don't have that on that property. No, I don't have that on it. But it but you got a hundred thousand unsecured, unsecured that's that right. you used so that's, on that property. Okay, correct. I got All twenty right. in the line of well, it's less than a hundred, but it's like twenty in the line of credit. Yeah, and about you know fifty, like about fifty from your favorite place so far. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. yeah, I got I got that one, and then we bought another house, a four family, for about four for for half a million, but we got it down to like four fifty. We put some money into it. We put about forty into it. It's What's it worth today? Probably like six fifty. And what do you owe on it total? What I owe on it right now? Mm-hmm. Four fifty. Okay, so I got eight fifty. Okay, there it is. All right. And then we have about uh, my wife. She got a car, twenty three thousand in car, and about six thousand on credit cards. No student loans. We paid all that off. And yeah. Okay. Why you, why are you calling us? How can we help? Um now here's the thing. The my, my the property that doesn't have any debt on it, right? I need to pull money out that property to get rid of the interest rate on the debt that I took out the to, to, to renovate it, right? Yeah, why are you so, calling us? To see What do you want to do? <laughs> how could you what's the best way to structure it and to see what your recommendation is? Okay. Um, I started buying real estate when I was 22. By the time I was 26, I owned $4 million worth, and I had a mm-hmm. about a $3 million debt on it. So I had a $1 million mm-hmm. worth of equity in the real estate, starting from nothing. Um, what you're doing sounds very stressful to me. It does not sound like there's any peace in your voice. <laughs> yeah, we try to figure it out. We try to structure everything, so. Yeah, I think you. I think you play the edges on everything, don't you? Uh, no, nah, not really. You know, yeah, I, I, my, my truck. Yeah, you I do. I got a Chevy Tahoe that has one hundred and seventy thousand miles on it. I never went to a dealership to buy a car. So dude, I, dude, I don't you, treat you, myself. You've moved the P three or four <laughs> times on the shell, still trying to hide it, just in this conversation. <laughs> yeah, you're. You're. And um, we're not in the debt restructuring business. We're in the debt payoff business. And it doesn't sound like you're at a point where you want to become completely debt-free or that you're willing to do what it takes to get there. Yeah, so the, the, the question you're asking out and the, the answers we're going to give uh, are all around the same issue. The issue is, okay, you're 33. When you're 43, what moves are going to make you the best off? Okay. The best off financially and have the best quality of life with four little kids and both of you work in big uh, high-stress jobs. Uh, and everything. So I'm going to get rid of one of these properties and a whole bunch of not, if not all of this debt in the process, okay. because I think that's going to add an amazing amount of peace to your life. A, you cut your uh, number of tenants in half. B, you got rid of almost, if not all of your debt. So 400 and 166 pays off. The, you get rid of everything but the uh, debt on the rental. You're, you pay off your mortgage, your car, your credit cards, and the 100000 that's owed, and you sell the $400,000 property. That's probably what I'm going to do because that will take me – because the peace and the calm, steady movement rather than the flailing about will cause you to build more wealth over time. And you, you've, been, you've been just kind of pushing the edges on this. Maybe you don't realize you are, but it, it – um, and if you don't realize you are, that's even more of a problem. Because I, I know this guy because I was him. I mean, I, I, they, 
something about the real estate business, they take the risk meter out of your heart and they put it on a table and hit it with a hammer and break it. So you no longer can measure risk. And you don't you don't perceive that all of this is risk. You just see returns. You get a it's little starry. Like, well, the renters are paying it off. No, they're not. The renters don't pay their bill half the time. You got a problem all the time with that, and so it, it's just an issue. So no, I um, you know, I'm going to move you backward. What feels like backward to you, but set you into a real calm place. Let, let's visit where you are at that point. Okay, that probably the 650 with the 450 loan is cash flowing. It's probably cash flowing a little, not a lot. But you got zero debt then. No house payment, no car payment, no $100,000 unsecured hanging out there at a high interest rate. And you only got a couple tenants. And you make $275,000 a year. And you're 33 years old. That's a much better place than where you are today, brother. To be That's a much more solid platform to launch into the future. We don't find... Alan, very many people in our millionaire study that borrowed their way into becoming millionaires using the system you're using or that I used when I went broke. Um, most people, the vast majority of millionaires do not do that to become millionaires. And so that data is real. It's not a theory and it's not a, well, what about the... There's no arguing with the actual data. Most people, Dave, especially young guys, they want to get into real estate investing. And our advice is to have a paid-for property for yourself first, then do all of your real estate investing in cash. To them, that sounds insane. Why yes. do we say that? Because the shortest distance to wealth is always no debt. It's the shortest, fastest route. And it's not just I made that up. I mean, it's in the Bible, borrower, slave to the lender. Oh, also, all the data with the 10,000 millionaires that we've studied. Oh, also, if you just walk around and talk to rich people, they're not going to tell you, you know, I did it with Bitcoin. You know, I did. Hey, I got this big hit. I bought llamas. I bi- opened a llama farm. They were big one time. There was a big get rich quick thing on llama farms. Llama farms. Wow. Yeah. And I bought Beanie Babies. They don't tell you that. And they don't say, I did nothing down real estate. Because I got to tell you, man, I, I, I knew probably 100 people doing nothing down real estate in the 80s. A hundred percent of them are out of the business. Wow. Or they paid off everything and got out of the debt business. One of the two. I actually know one guy that he, he cashed out of about three quarters of his portfolio, ended up with 25% as many properties, and they were all debt free. That changes he got everything. Ti- he, got tired of li- he got tired of living on the edge. And Most people go, well, that's stupid, Dave. You're losing out on all the cash flow of the properties. Well, the thing is, in the, in, when they're leveraged, they don't cash flow that much. You know that four fifty over six fifty. He's not making much money. After Your you, margins on that after you profits. have after you have vacancy, uh, you have loss. You know credit loss, meaning they don't pay their bill. They go into bankruptcy. You have a heat and air unit go out. You have a roof leak. Um, you know you pay your taxes. You pay. You know, and by the time you finish all that, he's not making much cash flow on that. He, he's not getting rich off that house. Now the value may be shooting up, but the actual cash on cash, there's not much there. So this idea that somehow you're going to like, the, I'll just buy a house and the money just starts coming in. No, it really doesn't if you leverage it up to your eyeballs. So it's all about delayed gratification. Yeah. It's go a little slower or go a lot slower, which in the end of the story ends up being faster. He who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Corey is in Little Rock. Hi, Corey. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. What's up? Hi, Dave. How are you? Better than I deserve. How can we help? Um, I, my name is Corey. Um, I'm 32, and I my boss just passed away a couple of weeks ago, and so he left me some money, and so I'm just trying to really figure out what I'm supposed to do. Like my dad has told me what I need to do, but it's just it's a lot going on, and I'm just trying to because I don't have a job now since my boss passed away, but. Your boss help. left you money in his will. Yes. yes. Wow, that's an unusual arrangement. I was his personal assistant for eight years. Okay. Yeah. So he he did. Um, he was an oil contractor, and so I did all his scheduling, everything. I was 
as he used to call me, his go-to go-to gal uh-huh. all the time. So, I mean, I just kept up with all his books and everything that he needed done. And so after I knew and he, he was didn't have pass, he didn't have family then. He did. He did. Okay. So his wife is the one that actually called me and let me know that I was left something. Oh, said, okay. So he didn't leave everything to you. No, 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 no. Okay, no. I'm just, I'm just trying. It's just an unusual story. It's a wonderful story, but I'm trying to understand. So, the uh, how much did he leave you? One point two five million dollars. Yes. Wow. Oh and my was- God. I, well, That's just know, wild. I, I, I couldn't. Be, I couldn't believe. Well, what, what, I mean, what was the old guy worth? A billion or something? <laughs> I, he 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 has a lot. I mean, several properties. I helped him manage his properties. He would take me on trips with him and his family. My mm-hmm. kids. He took care of my kids. I mean, wow. He was an amazing person. Wow. So, are you married? No. Okay. How old are your kiddos? I have a 15-year-old, a 4-year-old, a 3-year-old, and an 11-month-old. And what was your income before before you lost your job? I was making sixty five k, $65,000 a year. Mm-hmm. $1.25 million. Wow. And it, I was pretty much living paycheck to paycheck doing that. I mean, I shouldn't have, but, I mean, my kids are, I'm doing it on my own, so. Yeah. So do you have any debt currently? Any consumer debt? Uh, Yes, I have um, student loans, and I have about forty thousand dollars in student loans. Okay, um, we're renting an apartment, so just month by month, that's twelve hundred dollars for our rent. And then my car, my mom gave me um, her car, so I have a two thousand six Honda Odyssey minivan. Okay. All right. Well, you're very wise. You sound a little bit overwhelmed by this, a little bit scared even. I, I, it, look, my dad suggested that I, because my boss was very flexible with my, with, because he knew I had kids and everything, so it was a lot of, I could work from home, Zoom calls, calls and everything like that. I could do a lot of stuff from home, but now I don't think if I get another job, I will have that, and it's kind of the viewpoint my dad was looking at so he was thinking like maybe if i take a break until my youngest who's 11 months old starts kindergarten because right now it would be like daycare for all of them well mine is my 15 year old it would be daycare for all of them and he doesn't think that it would be wise for me to go back to work just yet and just use the money i don't i don't i don't know okay all right well, what what I would suggest you do is that you build a, um, l- let me kind of pan back. Let's just zoom back for a second from worrying about uh, what we're doing tomorrow. Overall, someone just handed you $1.25 million to manage. That's your new job. And you don't know how to do it. Okay. Is that right? Yes. That's why you call me. Yes. And that doesn't make you bad. That doesn't make you bad. It's just that you've never managed one point two million dollars before, right? No, not okay. me. <laughs> definitely not. So what you do when you have a, a responsibility that large, which is what this is, it's not a woohoo! I hit the lottery moment. And I don't hear that in your voice, by the way. I hear a little bit of fear, a little bit of grief still from your friend passing away. A little bit of shock and awe, which I have in my voice, that you got this much money from your employer. That's pretty cool. Um, And uh, so here's what I suggest that people do. You need to, A, number one, move slowly. Okay. If you feel urgency or someone pushing you, stop. Okay. Okay. Because where may people make mistakes when they don't know what they're doing is they go too fast. Let's pretend you're driving a car for the very first time. I took my kid out in the church parking lot with the Jeep and the straight shift to teach him how to do the stri- drive and to do the straight shift. The first rule is don't even change gears. Let's just figure out and move slowly. Get in trouble. Stop. Okay. Right? And that's what you're going to do right. here because it's something you've never done before. Okay. Second rule is the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. 
So I want you to build your own advisory group, your own board of directors, not to tell you what to do, but to advise you and teach you, and then you decide what to do. Okay. You got a pencil? Yes. You ready to write? Okay. First thing you need is you need an investment advisor. Click SmartVestor at Ramsey solutions.com you can find one that we suggest the second thing you need is a tax advisor click taxi lp at ramsey solutions.com and find one that you like the third thing that you need is sometime in the next year i suspect you're probably going to buy a home and pay cash for it an inexpensive home under two hundred thousand dollars okay and you're going to need a good real estate agent that's your third person on your board, on your advisory board. Again, we've got ELPs that can sit down with you and help you with that. You need to make sure you have the right kinds of insurance in place. So you need an insurance person. I don't have per- health insurance and anymore. It, there you go. You need insurance in place. And you, again, we've got ELPs to help you with insurance. We're not in any of these businesses, but we've got people set up to where you can form your advisory board and their goal is not to tell you what to do, and your goal is not to hire a babysitter. You're a grown woman. So your goal is to gather information from advisors by which you go slow enough that you learn, and then you make the decisions. Okay. And I think you can buy a home for cash and invest some of this and not have to go back to work. Okay. I can do like my dad said. Yep. But it's okay. not it's not by using the money. It's by investing the money and using the money that the investment creates. Okay. We're not going to use any of the money. We're going to put it in an investment and it throws off an income for you to live on. Okay. With your investment advisor and you're going to not need a lot of income because your house is going to be paid for and your car is going to be paid for. You're not going to have any debt and you're going to be on a budget. Okay, because like I said, I live paycheck to paycheck. You're not going to live paycheck to paycheck anymore. You're just going to tell every dollar what it's going to do that's coming in. You're going to have more dollars than you used to have. Okay. And I want you to go through Ramsey Plus, go through Financial Peace University and learn how to handle money. I'm going to pay for that. We're going to give it to you for a year because you've got to get up on top of this thing or you're going to live with this horrible taste on the back of your tongue called regret. Move slowly and learn and put advisors in your corner. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, click here to watch the next one where you'll hear some of the most unbelievable marriage fights.